I hope we see this kind of crowd at every event this year. This is wonderful. Thank you all for coming. You can see that the title of my presentation is The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of a New Hampshire Hill Town. And you'll find out just how that happened in the town of Stoddard over the last 250 years plus. And just for those of you who are interested, and I'll do some of this as I go through, this picture of the town center was taken on December 31st of 1901. So that's what it looked like. Still lots of cleared fields at that time. So I'll talk about the settlement here by European settlers in the 1760s, the town's Revolutionary War conflict or controversy, agriculture, industry, the town's decline, how it survived, technological advances, and the attraction of the natural landscape, all of that resulting in revival and lots of land conservation in Stoddard today. I think you all know where we're located, but that is Stoddard, right in the corner of the county of Cheshire, Cheshire County. So we're way in the north, and we're one of the last towns in the region that was settled because the settlers came up from the south, mostly from Massachusetts and Connecticut. The Massachusetts border is below us and the Vermont border to the west. So we're right in the northeast corner. And Stoddard is the second largest town in the county as far as area goes. Only one town is slightly larger. So the settlers arrived here in the 1760s, but Native Americans were here for thousands of years before that. We have not found evidence of any um, Indian encampments in the area, but lots of artifacts were found near Highland Lake in the 50s by an amateur archaeologist who had a, a summer place there. So we think that they used the lakes, and at that time it was streams and a few ponds, to, to travel. It was easier to travel along waterways than through the woods and over the mountains. So they may well have traveled along what is today Highland Lake. <clears throat> Stoddard was a Masonian township once the English settlers arrived. So the land here had formerly been granted to Captain John Mason long before Stoddard was ever settled. And uh, he was given a huge piece of land that included much of what is New Hampshire today. So the, there were some businessmen in Portsmouth in the 1700s who got title to that land. They actually went to Mason's grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and bought their rights to it and began to then settle towns out here in the western part of the state of New Hampshire. And most of the towns to the east by the coast had already been settled, so they didn't do anything with those towns. They came out here and set up the towns, and we can learn a great deal about the area because of the records that they kept. The land was inexpensive or it was free, to come and settle here. The proprietors wanted to get the town settled so that more people would be interested in coming and they could sell the rest of the land for more money. The town was originally granted in 1752 as Monadnock Number no. 7 or Limerick, which was a wonderful name, but unfortunately they decided to change it. The grant was renewed in 1767 because it wasn't settled under the original grant. And the town was settled in 1768. I mentioned that the settlers had to keep records of their work here to prove that they were doing what they needed to, to to keep the land that they got very inexpensively. So these are some of the records. The property owners are listed there. It tells whether or not they have a house, how long they've been in town, what they have for livestock, how much land they had cleared. So these are wonderful records for the early history to show us what was happening. It says one man's house has burned lately. I hope he rebuilt. <clears throat> Enough people had settled successfully for the town to be incorporated in 1774 under the name of Stoddard, and that's what we're celebrating throughout this year. It was named for Samson Stoddard, who was a surveyor who surveyed the town, much of the town, and he owned a great deal of land here originally as well. Stoddard was settled by European settlers in 1768. John and Martha Taggart and their family were the first white people who lived in town. They moved here from Peterborough. And the piece of land where the Stoddard Historical Society building is today is where they built their small cabin. The Taggarts arrived in June of 1768. They built a log house on the property. All the family supplies were carried from Peterborough at that time. 
because they hadn't settled in and started farming. Uh, so for example, John carried his plow on his back from Peterborough, 18 miles, to get out here to Stoddard. And his wife, Martha, carried her spinning wheel as they moved into their new home. John walked to Peterborough to work in the fields for residents over there, some of his old friends, to gain some cash so he could buy supplies. And the family had perhaps a kitchen that looked much like this. Actually, Mrs. Taggart went along with him to Peterborough and worked in the fields and got the same wage that he did for doing that. So that was unusual for that time, I believe. And we believe, we are told, that she dug the family well behind the Historical Society building with their fire shovel. And the well is still there today. So the, their nearest neighbors were several miles away. On one occasion in the dead, uh, oh, there's her well. On one occasion in the dead of winter, Mr. Taggart delayed a trip for supplies because of deep snow and bitter cold. The weather didn't improve, however, and he finally decided he had to go to Peterborough and get some supplies. A blizzard struck just after he got there, and uh, he couldn't leave Peterborough for three more days, and on the 10th day, he finally headed back to Stoddard. Um, after three feet of snow fell, he came back on his snowshoes and got back to his yard on the 11th day. He was afraid to approach the house, which is, well, it is not, it's on there somewhere, I think, <laughs> maybe with a different name. And uh, he came into the yard fearing that his family would have frozen to death or starved to death, but he heard noise, so smoke coming out of the chimney, ran in, and the family was fine. And the family story is that Martha killed a moose with the family axe to feed her family. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. That's what the family said, but they survived on moose meat anyway. <clears throat> so they survived that harsh winter. In August of 1771, the proprietors who granted the land and ownership of the settlement reported that Taggart was an old, soul, an old settler who had been there with his wife and family for a year and a half and had rye, hay, and grass aplenty. In December of that year, he was reported as having a log house, three head of cattle, nine acres cleared, three more acres cut but not cleared. And by that time, there were 40 pole houses and log cabins in the town. So people were coming in quickly. By the time he died in 1792, Stoddard had more than 700 residents. Oh, there he is, headed to Peterborough. Sorry, my slides are a little messed up. There's his house with his cattle. Some of them, actually drawn on the map. The settlers who came here were farmers. Agriculture was their livelihood. They came to farm the land and support their families. So they had to clear the land of all the trees and try to get the rocks out of the way so they could plant crops and pasture their cows. The, a few mills were built soon after that to, uh, they needed sawmills to cut the wood to build their houses and their fences and grist mills to grind their grain and blacksmith shops as well. And this is the earliest view that I know of of Stoddard. This was taken in 1861. This is by Cold Spring Pond. So this is the road to Marlow and Cold Spring Pond is over here. But imagine trying to farm that land. Look at the rocks everywhere there. But they were farmers and there was a blacksmith shop and a carding mill, so they soon needed mills as well. There's one of the mills, Woods Mill, in the southwest part of the town in its later years, a sawmill. And there's a drawing of Stearns Foster's blacksmith shop here in the village. There was no real separation of church and state. Actually, you paid taxes town taxes to hire the minister and to take care of the meeting house, which was where church was held, but also um, all town meetings were held here. This is the Hillsborough, New Hampshire meeting house, but the record indicates that the Stoddard meeting house built in the 1780s, right um, across from the Dow Hill Cemetery on School Street, was an exact copy of this one. So that was the large meeting house that would have been on Dow Hill. What? They didn't like 
The, <laughs> so you had to pay taxes and everything was done in this one large meeting house. Church was very important to these people. And also the church was really the main social activity in the colonial period. So it was important to go to church to get your religion and to see your friends. Early settler Oliver Parker submitted the petition for incorporation and New Hampshire Governor Wentworth appointed him to call the first town meeting. He announced to the townspeople that the first town meeting would be held in his dwelling house on December 1st of 1774, after the town was incorporated in November. That is his house on Pitcher Mountain. It is still there today across from the Pitcher Mountain farm. So that's where the first town meeting and a few after that were held. At that meeting, he was chosen as moderator town clerk, and the first selectman for the town. Two other selectmen were chosen. He had all the jobs. It's obvious that he was very important and influential in the town. He obtained the town's incorporation almost single-handedly, was the first man to hold all of those town offices. He was the political leader and one of the wealthiest men in town. He owned a lot of acreage. And he soon began to build the first meeting house, almost single-handedly on the hill behind his own house. It was not completed for a couple of years, so as I mentioned, several more town meetings were held here in his house. When the Revolutionary, <clears throat> Revolutionary War began, however, he remained loyal to Britain, which didn't go over very well with his friends. He was a loyalist, and like many other well-to-do colonists, they thought we were going to lose the War of Independence and that the people with the rich, with the money and the land would lose it to the British government if we lost. It would be punished by the, by the British. But it is true that he believed it was wrong to revolt against the mother country as well, and we have that in some of his writings. And that's where his trouble began. He soon lost his post as town clerk, and he was replaced by Isaac Temple without the benefit of a public legal election. Isaac Temple was his political opponent here in town. At the town meeting in March of 1776, held in his house, he lost all of his town offices. At the same meeting, a three-man town committee of safety was chosen under a new law approved by the state. So the state was brand new, and it really wasn't run by legislature and the judge and the governor and so forth at that time. There was a committee of safety that was set up, very powerful, and they oversaw what was happening throughout the state. And each of the towns had a committee of safety as well. So his Petition, his position of importance really was rapidly deteriorating in town. He was ordered to appear before the local committee of safety to answer, against a, answer a complaint that he appeared hostile to America. 18 months in the past, he had been the town leader, obviously. But now, in May of 1776, he was branded a traitor against America. There was never any proof that he committed a crime or caused any damage to the revolutionary cause, but he may have spent some counterfeit money he was arrested twice, confined to his farm, and treated very poorly by his neighbors. But things like this really had nothing, there were some things that had nothing to do with the revolution that were used against him. There were a bunch of petitions going from Stoddard to the capital over in Exeter, back and forth, which wasn't very easy then. And these were both in his favor and against him. One claimed that he knocked down his neighbor's fences, led his cows into his neighbor's pasture, and there were some political disputes in the town, which really had little to do with the war effort. He did write a document saying that patriots were liars, thieves, and drunkards. So this upset the Committee of Safety. This was wartime, and as you know, during wartime, governments often suspend or ignore the usual laws to, to try to keep the war going in their favor. They saw loyalists as enemies, and they were right here in their town and in their state. He was eventually arrested for counterfeiting, based on hearsay, and then confined to his farm for the duration of the war. So they told him he had to stay on his farm as long as the war lasted. And he eventually was able to travel around town, but he could not leave during the next years of the war. Soon after the war ended, he sold his farm and he left Stoddard forever. So he has been gone for almost two and a half centuries after his political troubles, but his farmhouse still stands and is the oldest house in Stoddard, built in 1772. Most town residents did support the Revolutionary War and many joined the local militia companies. They 
went in under short enlistments because these were farmers who were simply enlisting in the militia to help. They would go away for a few months or for one battle, and then they would come back to work on the farm. They had to take care of their families. Some of our men fought at Lexington and Concord and marched to Ticonderoga and at the Battle of Bennington, especially when 2,500 New Hampshire men marched west across what is now Vermont to Bennington. 12 Stoddard men went and two of them did not return home alive. The original town center was on Pitcher Mountain, near where the farm is today. So there is Oliver Parker's house. That's where the farm is today. There was a tavern there at that time. And you can see there was a store. The first meeting house was eventually moved down across the street from Parker's and there was another store here. So this was the town center with roads coming and going in several directions, as you can see. So because of Oliver Parker's location of his home and the meeting house, our first town center was right up there at his home, the Butterfield House today. In the late 1700s, that moved down the hill to near where the school is today. That was the second town center. So the land was given for the cemetery and the meeting house that we saw earlier. And there was doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, a school, a tavern, and several other businesses, a store here near the cemetery. In 1790, there were 701 people in the population here, so it was going up rapidly, and one slave. There were slaves in New Hampshire, and the Hunt family in Stoddard owned a slave at that time. Schools were, oh, there's the population listing, part of it, and that is not the page with the slave on it, unfortunately. Schools were organized very early. These people had been uh, educated in Massachusetts. They wanted their own children to be educated. It was important to them. There were 11 schools by 1820. Does anyone know why such a small town had so many schools? No school buses. The kids all walked to school, so they needed a school in every neighborhood. This is an interior of one of the schoolhouses with the girls reciting. And you can see the stove with the stovepipe to heat the room. 1820 was the peak of the town's population with 1,203 people. And it was the peak decade for agricultural production. People were growing crops and actually selling them. They were growing more than they needed. But we also had the sheep craze happening um, when people brought in merino sheep and had big herds of sheep and cleared all of the land for pasturing sheep because they could sell the wool. They actually had a cash crop now. So a vast majority of the land was cleared in Stoddard for agricultural purposes. It's hard to believe by looking around today, but it is true. That is the Worcester barn, which was up beyond where the school is today in the old town center. Three distinct, distinct villages developed in the town in the first half of the 1800s. The movement of the center down to the current location, just down the hill, to this location uh, near an intersection with new highways and businesses were located there. This is the Central House Hotel, as you can see, right across from the church. And a large store just down the street. Both of those long gone now. A tanner, a blacksmith, a post office, all was up there in, up here in the village. Institutional buildings were built, the church, the town hall, and a school. The Toleration Act of 1819 in New Hampshire gave you freedom to worship wherever you wanted to, so people began to leave the meeting house and the town church and go out on their own. So the church was built in 1836. As a result of that, the Congregationalists wanted their own building. And there it is, with the one-room school beside it. The sale of that old meeting house on the hill is an interesting story. It was sold to Nathan Morse. They were no longer using it. It was too big for the town to use, and the church congregations were all leaving the building. It was in a state of disrepair. Nathan Morse, a shoemaker, purchased it at auction for a bid of $105.37 and one half cents. And then he took it down and moved it down the street and built his house out of the old meeting house. So the Morse Mansion was built from the original meeting house. Built that in 1843. 
This picture is the village in 1867 or maybe early 1868. See all the cleared farmland in the distance, lots of barns and outbuildings when people were farming, cutting hay right here in the foreground. And we know the date because you can see the construction of the bell tower on this building, which was completed in 1868. So the framework is up, but they haven't completed the building. Mill Village was on a major waterway and had mills and manufacturing as its focus soon after settlement. This is an early picture in Mill Village. There were sawmills and grist mills and several woodenware factories there, including a chair shop, a furniture shop, a casket shop, a pail factory, and a box shop. And the box shop made thousands of boxes for the glass industry to pack their bottles in and ship them somewhere else to be used. The town also had powder keg factories, rake handle factories, scythe mills, scythe handle mills, ox yoke factories, and numerous pail and bucket shops powered by the water the numerous brooks and, and streams in town. They were also furniture makers. This bureau was made by Emery Millen in his father's furniture shop. Emery was learning the trade and he signed his piece as his signature piece. And that was made in the woods out behind where the town hall is today, up at the old Millen cellar hole and furniture shop. And finally, Mill Village was home to two glass factories for about 20 years in the mid-1800s, and tenements and stores were built for the workers as the village grew. These two buildings across the street, diagonally across the street from where the store is today, still used as homes, were built as tenements for glass factory employees. This is the carding mill that we saw earlier on the backside of Pitcher Mountain, so they were actually working with with some of that wool to get it ready to be used in the homes, carting it out. And the South Stoddard Village at the intersection of Concord Road and the Hancock Road, today routes 9 and 123, grew up quickly when the glass industry arrived there and soon became known as the city. The village was also known as Stoddard Box and that's what it was called when I was growing up. People still said they were going to go up to the box in the 1960s. So John Robb was either very wise or very lucky when he built his Green Mountain Hotel at the intersection there in the 1830s. The glass industry arrived 12 years later and increased his business dramatically. Some people believe that the size and shape of this popular hotel gave the village its name. It looks like a big box. But there are a couple of other stories too, which some of you have heard before. And one is that in the tap room, there was a fireplace and on the mantel was a box where they kept the cards so the guys could come in and gamble and play cards there in the tap room in the tavern. And the third explanation is my favorite and that is that one night those guys were in there playing cards, one of them got so drunk he passed out, they took him out, put him in a large wooden box, nailed him in and mailed him home to his wife. So that's, that's the one I like. This is Joseph Foster. He started the glass industry in Stoddard. He opened the first factory here. There were four companies, five factories in Stoddard between 1842 and 1871. And they employed hundreds of local residents and made millions and millions of bottles for the Northeast market. They were all bottle factories and the pieces were sold throughout New England and into New York. This is a Sarsaparilla bottle that was made in South Stoddard at one of the first factories. This is a billhead from the Granite Glass Works in Mill Village. And it's interesting to note how much they sold their wines for. 10 gross of quart wine bottles for $66.50. So 1,440 quart wine bottles for $66.50 or about four and a half cents each. They would then send these off for somebody else to fill with wine and to resell. In 1850, the South Started Glass Manufacturing Company produced 750,000 bottles that they sold for a total of $26,000. And now one Stoddard flask can demand 26,000 or more on the market. Very few of these pieces are marked with the town or the factory names. So you really have to know what you're looking at to identify Stoddard Glass. 
The blowers turned out hundreds of bottles every day, but many were very skilled craftsmen. There's a medicine bottle made in Mill Village, a variety of other medicine bottles, embossed with the name of the company and the town generally before they had paper labels. Some ink bottles, all made for the Farley's Ink Company in Marlow. Stoddard made mostly amber and brown bottles. They made some green and some almost black glass, but they could never make clear or blue glass here because of the high concentration of iron in the sand. So they could never make clear glass. And they were blown into iron molds like this, so they would get the embossing on that bottle when it was complete. Another billhead and a price list for Demijohns, bottles and flasks in South Stoddard. That's how much you had to pay to buy them per gross. These are the Stoddard flag flasks. They're the most well-known, the rarest of the Stoddard bottle pieces. Um, the large one on the right, these were made in Mill Village as well by the New Granite Glassworks. They have an American eagle, um, American flag on one side, and on the reverse it says New Granite Glassworks, Stoddard, New Hampshire. And these were made during the Civil War, so undoubtedly they were trying to be patriotic. The one on the right sells for twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars today, and the one on the left for about forty thousand or more, because it's just very, very rare. Very few of them still exist. They also made offhand pieces, so at the end of the day, they could blow glass into any shape they wanted to, to use the glass in the furnace because they couldn't let it get cold in there. So they would blow things like this miniature fireplace bellows. This is only about six inches long. They also made sugars and creamers and various cups and glasses, uh, turtle paperweights, rolling pins, and this is probably the most famous soldered piece that exists. There are 10 or 12 of these known. This is called a lily pad pitcher. It was made by Matt Johnson, who was the master blower in South Stoddard for more than 20 years. And these can sell for up to $50,000. Well, the companies went out of business because of the decline of the Saratoga spas. They sent lots of bottles over to Saratoga, New York. The customers decided they wanted clear glass and it couldn't be made in Stoddard. I guess they wanted to see what they were drinking. I'm not sure why but primarily because of the cost of transportation. The railroad never came to Stoddard, and it was too expensive to put these in wagons and boxes and in sawdust and get them over to the railroad, and they went out of business in 1873. Prior to the Civil War, the agricultural decline of the town was already well underway. This is an abandoned farmhouse in Stoddard. The farmers were leaving the tired soil in Stoddard and headed west for new and better farmland. They couldn't compete in Stoddard with the produce being produced in New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, which was being shipped here at first on the Erie Canal and then on the railroads that were being built. So they decided to go somewhere else and try to find a better life. So they went to better soil or they went to the larger towns and cities to work in factories where they could work just six days a week, not seven, and only 10 hours a day, not all day long to try to survive on the farm. Some far farms survived a bit longer by taking in outwork to do in their home. So this included weaving wicker around the larger Stoddard bottles, making palm leaf hats, which were, was supplied by storekeepers, or weaving chair seats and backs for the local chair shops. So you could bring this work into your home, get a few pennies for doing those things, and earn a little extra income. My great-grandparents who lived in this house near this farmhouse near Center Pond would hop in the wagon and go the four miles over the hill to the, the chair factory in Munsonville and pick up some chair backs and chair seats and some rattan and go home and weave it and take it back and get a few pennies each. <clears throat> uh, I have my great-grandfather's diary and he said in 1900 they got six cents each for weaving a chair. The Civil War had a major impact on the town, despite the fact that the fighting took place hundreds of miles from here. Stoddard native J.D. Hale, shown here on the left, had left the town and moved to the south, and he served as a spy for the Army of the Cumberland all the way through the war, for four years. He had gone to Tennessee, married a rich heiress, built a town there, and when the war started, he supported the Union, so his neighbors burned the entire town. So he went to the military and 
signed up to serve as a scout or spy for the Union Army. He was never enlisted into the military to try to protect his identity, try to keep it secret. And after the war, they lost everything. They tried to go back and resettle and rebuild, but the KKK came and tried to kill him and his son. So they escaped back to Stoddard and ended up here. Father and son, Conrad Weber Sr. and Conrad Jr. were recent immigrants from Switzerland. They worked for the Granite Glass Company weaving their rattan around the bottles in their home, the whole family did, and both enlisted in the Union Army, in their new home where they'd only been for about 10 years here in the United States. Conrad Jr. died of disease at a military hospital in Virginia in 1863 at age 20 by eating poison pie that the Confederate soldiers left out for the Union soldiers to eat. And Conrad Sr. died as a prisoner of war at Salisbury Prison in 1864 at age 52. So his wife and his daughter were left here in their small house very near the shores of, of Island Pond. His wife soon became insane and the daughter was left alone to fend for herself. Perhaps the town's most interesting Civil War tale is that of the Stevens family of South Stoddard. Six sons enlisted in the military during the war. The youngest, Henry, couldn't sign up until 1864. His parents told him they needed him on the farm. But then in 1864, he went away, signed up, and just three weeks later, he died of disease at a hospital in New York. Well, his body was shipped home to be buried. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Unfortunately, when, he, when the coffin arrived, the family buried it in their family plot, and soon another one arrived with his name on it. So they weren't really sure what was going on. So they checked. The first one was some young man. They had no idea who it was. The second one was their son. So they buried their son in the family plot. The military would not take back the other guy. They said, no, nope, you've got him now. You're going to keep him. And they didn't know who he was. And so they buried him in the cemetery, and this Stone, for Stoddard's unknown soldier, is there in the South Stoddard Cemetery where the Stevens family lived. So some family somewhere never learned what happened to their son. <clears throat> James Hunt was one of 13 Stoddard men, including Conrad Weber Sr., who enlisted in one week in August of 1862, led by the town minister, Samuel Gerald, who said he wanted to go and fight for freedom and for what was right, and encouraged his parishioners to do so, and 13 of them signed up in one week. Most of the 13 returned home after three years of service. One of them was James Hunt, young James Hunt. And 55 years later, Mr. Hunt donated the Civil War Soldiers Monument on the lawn of the church at the old home day celebration in 1917. Some veterans didn't return home because they died in the battles or of disease, but many others found better opportunities elsewhere. They didn't want to come back to the dying farms in the hills of Cheshire County, and they went elsewhere, so the population continued to decline at that point. Others joined in this exodus, a great flood of families leaving Stoddard after the war ended. They often couldn't get enough for their farms to wait around and try to sell them, so they packed up their belongings, closed the door, and rode away. And soon there were dozens of abandoned farmhouses throughout the woods of Stoddard. And they were soon, as this one shows, damaged by the ravages of nature. This is the Copeland House on Kings Highway out toward Washington. There were many auctions as families left town. They would sell belongings and, and head out. The Reed family was one family that stayed. This is one of my favorite pictures of town, so I had to put it in. This is in their farm near Center Pond, where Chet Pratt lives today in the same house. So Mr. and Mrs. Reed and their son, they stayed there until their deaths, even though they were the last family farming out there. Until the 20th century, Stoddard never had more than wagons and stagecoaches and horses for transportation. Uh, this is actually in Munsonville at the... Nelson end of Granite Lake, but you can see the chair factory there was loading up their chairs to ship them away. This is the factory where my great-grandparents went to, to do their weaving. The last glass factory closed in 1873 because of that, chiefly because of that transportation problem. The railroad never came to Stoddard. 
So other small shops and factories began to close as well, including this grist mill in Mill Village. From the peak of population with 1,203 people in 1820, the population declined dramatically through the 1800s as the farm families abandoned the farms and the mills closed one by one. The population decreased to 400 people by 1890 and just 113 people in 1930. So how did the town survive with everyone leaving? Well, the farms began to revert to forest, especially white pine forest, which grew first and fastest, and they started using it. And they no longer needed water because they could have these steam mills. This is Littlefield's mill, again, up on King's Highway. You could take your mill right out to the woods and, and cut the new trees that were growing there. So a lot of people worked in the woods, worked in the wooden industry. Logging and woodenware became important. Chris Robb was probably the most successful woodenware manufacturer. He built what is probably the biggest business ever in town when he developed the Stoddard Lumber Company, shown here. He opened his first sawmill in the 1850s, and by 1890, he had dozens of employees and owned 6,000 acres. So with all of those farms being abandoned, you could buy the land really inexpensively and often by simply paying the unpaid back taxes. So he soon had 6,000 acres, and he controlled the water rights to Long Pond, Island Pond, and the North Branch River, allowing him to float his logs all the way down what became Highland Lake to the mills down at the end of Island Pond, and this gave him lots of water power to run his mills as well. Here are some of his products headed to market in 1896. This is the Cherry Valley operation where there was a post office and a boarding house, a restaurant, and all of the mills and related buildings there. When he died in the 1890s, his son-in-law, Charlie Merrill, took over the management, but he was not the businessman his father-in-law had been, and when the factory burned in the early 1900s, it really was already going downhill and was never rebuilt. A second livelihood at the time was cattle droving. Some of the farmers stayed and there were lots of old fields, so they would bring in cows during the summer to fatten them up in the fields of Stoddard, and then they would have a cattle drive and walk them down to the market at Brighton, Massachusetts in the fall. So they did cattle drives from here. Those are some of my grandfather's cows at his farm on Granite Lake. So they got the land again inexpensively or by paying back taxes. My grandfather eventually owned something over 2,000 acres, by, mostly by paying back taxes. Here's a cattle drive in Stoddard Center in the early 1900s. And there's my grandfather's farm on Granite Lake. And notice the open pasture that he used to pasture the cattle behind the lake, behind his house. So that lasted into the 1920s, early 1920s, when the fields were growing in in Stoddard, and it was becoming more and more difficult to walk your cows 80 miles over the roads because there were so many cars now. Um, several of the old timers who worked with my grandfather were still around when I was a little kid. One of them told me one time that my grandfather always stopped with his herd of cows, 100, 200 cows, just before he got into Brighton and gave them a good long drink of water. So they would weigh more when he got them in to sell them <laughs> by the pound. So. The third new livelihood was the most important and longest lasting. That was tourism. As early as the 1840s and 50s, people were coming to the region to climb Monadnock. Farmers were renting them rooms and serving them meals. It was about another generation before summer tourists arrived in Stoddard. This is a group at Hunt Rock at Center Pond, camping out in the summer on the shores of Center Pond. Charlie Merrill, that last owner of the Stoddard Lumber Company, began to market his 6,000 acres for other things in the early 1900s. He owned much of the land around Highland Lake and Island Pond, and he began to rent small lots for people to come and camp, and then he started to sell them, and he publicized this, quarter acre lot, so you could come and build a summer cottage, and you could take a ride on his steamboat, the Myra, named for his wife, Myra. He didn't get rich on it, but people began to realize the beauty of Stoddard's lakes, hills, and forests. The Island House, 
in Mill Village catered to sportsmen and summer visitors. It was known for its specialty horn pout stew. So there are stories of people going out to the lake out back and catching hundreds of horn pout in a night. So horn pout stew was their specialty. This burned in 1911. A few small summer cottages began to appear. This is the interior of the Dodge Cottage on Granite Lake in 1909, I believe. Summer camps for young people began to appear on the shores of these various lakes. Kids from the city would come out for a month or two and learn about healthful living surrounded by nature for the summer. This is Camp Winnicomac. That's actually where David and Cece Frechette live in Stoddard on Granite Lake today. Camp Oahe was in the same location later, operated by Charles Eastman, who had a Sioux family background. His Indian name was Oyesa. He attended Dartmouth College. And the female campers learned about Native American life, games, and nature practices at the summer camp. A tea house was opened alongside Concord Route 9, uh, Concord Road, Route 9, to cater to the new automobile travelers, people who were driving now needed a place to stop to refresh themselves. So this old home was turned into a tea house. They supported a limited number of residents, however, and as I mentioned, the population continued to decline to a low of 113 people in 1930. So the town had averaged a loss of 10 people every year for 110 years in a row, 1830, 1820 to 1930. So there was really some question if the town would survive at all. Mr. Rice in Mill Village survived, or partly, earned some extra income by renting boats to people who came to, to row around the lake. More of the older houses were lost. This is the central house in 1906, in, here in the village, just up past the historical society. But 50 years later, that's what it looked like. It couldn't be saved, it was torn down, and all of the woodwork in the tap room, uh, the wainscoting, the, the bar, uh, and the mantle was taken to the Mystic Seaport Museum, where it was installed as part of their exhibit. And it is now at the Johnson and Wales University in Rhode Island. This is the Mountford Farm I mentioned earlier, and like many others, it reverted back to forest. So that is the same view today. This is right on the Manadnock Sunapi Trail, just beyond Center Pond. So there you go, the same view. But the seeds of tourism had been planted, however, and improved automotive technology soon changed the nature of life in Stoddard, forcing road improvements. People began to want to travel to these old towns on the back roads in cars like this. People began to buy land on the shores of the lakes and build summer cottages, and the new cars allowed them to comfortably drive from other areas in New Hampshire, or eventually Massachusetts and Connecticut, to visit their cottage on the weekends or for a few weeks in the winter. And some of the old farmhouses were saved and revived as summer homes. This is the Richardson house just up the street behind us here. Finally, the auto allowed people to live in town and work elsewhere as the technology continued to improve. So Stoddard became something of a bedroom community. People could live here, enjoy nature, be in some of the old farmhouses, and drive to work in Keene or Peterborough or Hillsborough and still enjoy the small town. Uh, for those of you who have been around for a while and might be interested, that's Mary Lane and Bill Lane and Morris Mansell lined up there left to right. All of these people who were coming to visit wanted services, like stores and gas stations and boat rentals and restaurants. And the arrival of electricity in the town finally in 1938 helped with all of that. The census takers in 1940 reported that the population rose slightly in the previous 10 years, and it has been increasing ever since. A couple of natural disasters in the town about this time impacted the landscape. Oh, that's an improved road that they were building. and. Uh, they were the hurricane of 1938, and then the famous Marlowe Stoddard forest fire of 41. So the hurricane blew through, causing some serious damage to a few buildings, including blowing down the barn at the Pitcher Mountain Farm. And the family indicates that the farmer was in the milk room at the time. It was blown down, so he survived because he wasn't inside the barn. 
A Civilian Conservation Corps camp was set up in town to clear the roads and salvage the timber after the, after the hurricane. Portable sawmills were set up throughout the area, and at one of those mills in Marlow in April of 1941, a fire was accidentally ignited by a spark from one of the pieces of the machinery, and the workers couldn't put it out. It had been a very dry and hot April, and the fire quickly spread over the next two and a half days. It burned across Marlow, 48% of the town of Marlow, and then 42% of the town area in Stoddard and also into Gilsom and Washington and still is the largest forest fire in New Hampshire history at well over 20,000 acres burned. 2,000 men converged to fight the fire and several homes were lost to the fire. But it was, this is Highland Lake, and you can see it actually jumped the lake and continued on the other side, burned most of the buildings at Marywood. And it was put out by a freak snowstorm on the third day of the fire, luckily. It was the largest forest fire in New Hampshire history, as I mentioned, about 27,000 acres. But no one was hurt by the fire, although several homes and buildings were lost. One result was better firefighting equipment, including a better equipped fire department in Stoddard, and a series of fire watch towers. There had been one on Pitcher Mountain that actually burned in the fire, but it was replaced and others were set up. During World War II, a CCC camp was, the CCC camp was reopened as a conscientious objectors camp, and that is where Louis Clark lived until recently. That was where the camp was located. And these, men's all, these men also worked in the woods, cleaning up and reopening the roads after the fire this time. And these were men who refused to fight in World War II, conscientious objectors to entering the military, and they sent them out here to work in the, in the forests. The towns, lakes, and ponds became even more important after the war as there was a real proliferation of development and building of summer homes. This is a view of Granite Lake, if you can't read the bottom there. The people who built these homes, however, were only here for the summer. So they paid taxes, but they demanded very little in the way of town services. So they didn't need fire protection in the winter. The kids didn't go to the school. Their roads didn't all need to be plowed. And this was a time when a few families were new to the town and were beginning to buy up large tracts of land. This was one piece that was included in some of those. This was unused farmland grown back to forest. A few of these families soon had holdings of 1,000 to 10,000 acres. One of them was Robert Burnett, the Vanilla King, who had the Burnett's uh, extract company in Boston. And he built this camp, this lodge on Cold Spring Pond and put together a few thousand acres of property because they wanted to come out and enjoy nature and nobody else wanted the land at that time. The lodge is still there today. Another was Lewis Cabot, one of the richest men in New England. He was from Boston, from the Cabot family, and he, was, he had a, a passion for hunting and fishing. Here was all this land that had been abandoned. He came up to Cheshire County, and he began to buy up lots of land, lots of land in Stoddard. He had hunting camps throughout the area. He bought land in Washington and Antrim and Dublin and Nelson and several local towns. And he owned so much land that one day when he was walking along in the woods, I think it was in the town of Nelson, uh, he was walking along in this old town road and he realized that the land he was walking through would have been wonderful bird hunting territory. So eventually he came out to a farmhouse on the road and the old farmer was out front and he went over to the guy and he said, uh, nice land back here. And the farmer said, yep. Yeah. He said, uh, do you think it's for sale? He said, I don't know. He said, well, why, you know, would you uh, tell me who owns it and maybe I can go and buy it? And the farmer said, well, some rich old cuss out of Boston, name of Cabot. <laughs> he owned so much land, he had no idea that he owned that land. And there are reports that he eventually owned about 100,000 acres in Cheshire County and just to the north. 
Although the summer population was increasing, the permanent year-round population increased more slowly. By the time I started school in the early 1960s, the population was still only about 150 people. And that's the school I went to. Not at that time period, but that's the school that I went to, along with several other people here in this room. The 25 to 30 students in grades one through six, when I was there, attended the last surviving one-room schoolhouse in town, built in 1850. The building had electricity, a furnace, storm windows, running water, and flush toilets. We didn't have to go to the outhouse anymore, but really little else had changed in the building since the 1850s. This is a view in maybe the 1850s, the 1950s, with the kids playing out front. I don't recognize any of them, but you know, this road's pretty quiet, so when you're playing baseball and you play center field, we stood right in the center of the street. <laughs> So there were six grades in the school when I went there, when my brother and sister went. There were eight grades before they shipped us, bussed us into Keene to go to school. And it continued to be used as the Stoddard School until it burned in 1979. The 1960s and 70s was also a time when some people were beginning to look for an alternative lifestyle, leaving the hustle and bustle of the city and living off the land. Several of these families came to Stoddard, perhaps partly inspired by a role model here named Pearly Sweat, the hermit of Taylor Pond. Many of you know his story. He was born in this house in the southwest corner of town in 1888. His early life was difficult, resulting in a broken marriage and the longest stay ever by an inmate at the Cheshire County Jail for non-payment of support for his family. When he finally got out of jail, he was rather bitter and he escaped to the family farm and seldom left, becoming a hermit simply because everybody else in the neighborhood moved away. He became famous, however, when he dug his own grave, and articles about him began to appear all across the country, from coast to coast. He put up a rude wooden grave marker, which if you can't read it there, says 1888 Taylor Pond Hermit, to November 26, 2013. When he was asked if he was, thought he would die on that day, he said, yeah, either then or before. <laughs> so he was well known in the region, actually became quite famous. Lots of people wanted to go to visit him out in the woods. And this book tells his story. If you haven't read it, you should. It was also at that time, the 1960s and 70s, that we began to see a trend that has continued in the town that Pearly loved. We were watching what was happening to in the south and the eastern part of, of the state and elsewhere in New England, becoming concerned about development and strip malls just showing up everywhere. We didn't want that to happen here. The land conservation trend and formal municipal planning was begun to try to control growth, not to stop growth, but to make it work properly for the town. We were lucky in Stoddard that there were several families that had bought large tracts of land they became interested in conserving their land as natural areas. Today, two thirds of the land and area is area, land in Stoddard is protected from development, either by public conservation organizations or by the landowners themselves who have placed permanent restrictions on the use of the land. This is the largest percentage of any town in New Hampshire south of the White Mountains. The land can be used in most cases for recreation, such as hiking, hunting, snowshoeing, and boating and fishing, but cannot be developed. Consequently, there's no one living on these properties that the town has to provide services for. Despite the conservation and all the natural land, other areas of the town have continued to grow in orderly fashion. The population of Stoddard passed 12, the 1200 mark again fairly recently for the first time since 1820. And the population doubles in the summer due to the summer residents, mostly around the numerous lakes and ponds. Their taxes help support limited town services. And there's also space for industrial growth along Route 9, designated for that purpose. This is Carlisle Lumber out there. People often ask me what's gonna happen in Stoddard over the next 50 years. And historians don't really feel comfortable with that type of question. But I don't think the character of Stoddard will change too much. There will undoubtedly be some industrial growth, population growth, 
perhaps doubling the population, but careful planning will guide how that is done. As I mentioned, Stoddard is the second largest town in the county area-wise, so that kind of growth can continue to occur even though there is so much conservation land. Who's number one? Winchester is slightly larger. So the percentage of con conservation land will increase, attracting visitors who want to get out and enjoy na nature, and they will also help support the local economy. For example, the Monadnock Boat Store is very busy in its facility on Route 9, for example, people who are enjoying our lakes and ponds. So this combination of history and natural beauty will continue to be important assets for the town of Stoddard well into the future. Thank you very much. Are there any burning questions or comments, things you'd like to share? Yes. <laughs> it's, I don't, I can't tell the first name. It's the Stone Arch Bridge Stoddard and it's by one of the Hogs, but I can't tell the first name from down here. I've got the wrong glasses on. Yes. Going back to the early 1800s, uh, had uh, a series of children within a few months or weeks. Yes. And I'm curious about what you know about yellow fever or other kinds of uh, epidemics that came through. That was very common. Um, just the childhood diseases could often wipe out a family: measles and chickenpox and 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 other typhoid and other diseases um, and so forth would come through the town. So it was very common for children to die under 10 years of age. If you made it to age 10, you generally had a very good chance to last a long, long time. But childhood diseases were very prevalent. There is one gravestone in the Dow Hill Cemetery that has seven children who died under the age of 12 in the same family, from one hour to 12 years old, 12, yeah, 12 years old. So it was very common for disease and epidemics to come through and, and wipe out the, all the children in a single family and then the children in a neighborhood. They really didn't have, they didn't understand the diseases as well and didn't have good ways to fight them. Ellen, is it, is it Max or May hog? Uh, May, okay. May, is it May I think that may be right. Yes. Did settlers come up the Connecticut River and the Merrimack River, and then finally ended up in the star at the top of the hill here? Chiefly, it was the Connecticut River when the first settlers were arriving here. Soon after that, they were coming other, from other parts of Massachusetts, but originally it was the Connecticut River. It was much easier to travel north up the river, as the Indians did, than to travel from the coast of New Hampshire through the swamps and forests and over the hills and mountains to get out here to Stoddard. So the settlers, and originally several of the towns in this region were granted by the colony of Massachusetts. And so they believed they were in Massachusetts before the boundaries were all clarified. Yes. Where's Mount Stoddard? Mount Stoddard is on Mount Stoddard Road. So right before the church, take the sharp left and you go through there. And if you continue along on the old road, you'll go up over Mount Stoddard and come out on Juniper Hill Road and come out on Route 9. Oh my. Yes. It may be a silly question, Alan, but the type uh, setting, was it really type that shows on some of those records or was somebody changing it? <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to notice that. <laughs> The state of New Hampshire in the late 1800s and early 1900s printed 40 volumes of the early records. So they had them all transcribed and they printed them. They're much easier to read than the originals, I would say. So that's why I put them up there. So though, that's from a 30 volume set called the New Hampshire State Papers. Thank you. Yes. Alan, when you had the first picture up of the shape of Stoddard, the southern border does a little jag and then there's a little triangle. What caused that part to get cut out from that original uh, square mason one you had up? 
the Tarbox family lived over there and they owned a couple of hundred acres and there was no road from their home into Stoddard. So they did all of their business in Nelson and Munsonville. That's where they went to church and that's where all of their activity was. They lived quite near to the village of Munsonville. So in the 18, I think it was 1835, they petitioned the state of New Hampshire to allow them to separate from Stoddard and join Nelson. And it was approved. So they, their farm, just their farm, was set off to the town of Nelson. <laughs> there, no, they, they had a couple of the lots and there was a little triangle left. So there's a little piece of Stoddard over there that go, looks just like this. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much.